I don't know how long I'm going to be able to preach after eating breakfast like we ate this morning. Yeah, praise the Lord, yeah. That sure was good. Thank you, ladies and children and all those that pitched in and helped. We truly appreciated that. All the men say, amen. amen. I have to keep drinking water because all that bacon really dried me out. So, uh, <laughs> Kids, I think you can be dismissed at this time. All right, I do want to thank everybody that showed up yesterday and even those that showed up through the week this past week to do some of the work around the church. There was a big work party yesterday. We really did a lot. And uh, for those of you that have history or know anything about that garage up there, I did not know that garage could hold all that it did. But uh, I was thinking the other day when they delivered the dumpster, I'm like, man, that's awful big. I think I overdid it on the dumpster. We probably could have got one size up, got a little bit bigger. So we didn't even get to the inside. So what you see overflowing the dumpster already was just from outside work. So uh, that was a lot. So thank you for your help and thank you for Pastor Dan. I think he just stepped out. Uh, thankful for him stepping in last week in my absence. We thoroughly enjoyed last Sunday getting to watch our son be installed in his church. I call that, I guess that weekend would be called our proud parent tour. So uh, that's a pretty proud moment to see your son installed as a pastor of a church. So I mean, I've been through it myself, but seeing your son go through it is a different thing. So just very thankful for that. So when Kathy and I were first married uh, just a couple of years ago, um, she worked at a department store, and I worked at Pizza Hut, and I was typically a closing delivery driver, which meant that I would be there until sometimes 2 or 3 in the morning cleaning up the mess after the long evening of making hundreds upon hundreds of pizzas and stuff. And I would get home really late. And, of course, getting home really late like that, my mind's still awake, and I didn't go to sleep right away. And, of course, she'd already be in bed. And I'd stay up a few more hours once I got home watching some TV or whatever, and then I'd go off to bed. And she'd get up early, go to work. I'd get up several hours after she left, maybe 9, 30, 10 o'clock, maybe sometimes 11. But anyways, don't judge me. Um, but uh, I used to love getting up, and I'd watch uh, the 700 Club, and uh, I would watch different TV preachers, particularly Charles Stanley or John Hagee. And uh, I don't know, I hate to say that a person like John Hagee had missed his calling, but sometimes I think John Hagee should have been a stand-up comedian. Um, he has some of the best jokes. And uh, I remember once he told a story uh, about a man who had taken his wife. I shared this with the men yesterday. So some of you are already smiling. Randy's already got that smile. He knows what's coming. Uh, a story of a man that took his wife and his mother-in-law to the Holy Lands. And I thought, well, that was a really nice trip, you know, taking your wife and your mother-in-law to the Holy Lands. Well, tragically, while they were in the Holy Lands, this man's mother-in-law passed away. And so here they are, clear over in the Holy Lands. And he's trying to figure out how to do arrangements and all those different things. And um, he talked to the local caretaker there in the Holy Lands and he said, it's going to cost five or $6,000 for you to have your mother sent back, mother-in-law to sent back to the States and taken care of there. He says, or I could do it here for $50. The man thought of it for just a minute and he said, you know, he looked at the, looked at the caretaker and he said, I think I'd like to send my mother-in-law back to the States. And he goes, are you sure? That's like five or $6,000. Again, I can do it for 50. And the guy said, yeah, but... The last person I knew that was buried in the Holy Lands came back three days later. So, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Don't you love when Milford amens even on things like that? I mean, so, this shovel is distracting me up here. I was thinking the kids must have wanted to really make you dig deep this morning. So, but all mother-in-laws are mad at me now, so I better move on. So, when I look upon our country, when I look upon the news, when I say news, you guys go, ugh, okay, ready? When I look upon the news, yeah, see, I feel the same way as you, it's just, it's crazy. Uh, we are living in some really crazy times, we are living in times that are just, well, let's just face it, they are flat out frustrating to watch. I, I am shocked at the level of moral depravity that we are seeing in today's world. It makes me angry. It makes me sad. It just flat out breaks my heart. And I wonder sometimes, 
with God, how does he feel when he looks down upon this land itself? I'm talking about just our country alone. We know the whole world's full of problems, but I think the biggest disease in our country today is sin. The disease of sin is at an all-time high. The level of moral depravity is like we've never seen it before. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you was having these discussions in certain circles at work or even in your Sunday school class or pastor was preaching or we talk about the things that could be. And when you talk about the things that could be in the future, how many of you remember hearing the words from other people saying, or maybe you even said it yourself, well, I don't think we'll ever see that happen. I remember thinking that so often in my own life. And the things that I would say, yeah, I don't think we'll ever see that happen. We're watching it happen. I cannot believe some of the things that we are exposed to as adults even. You know, we talk about shielding our kids from certain things, as we should. We do need to protect our children's minds, their hearts, and their ears, and their spirits. Amen? It's hard as an adult to step out into our world or turn on the TV and see all these different things that are coming at us at a rapid pace. The, the level of sin that is being celebrated and raised up and even edified in our culture today is sickening. Can I get an amen? It is truly sickening. So when I, when I look at our country, then I think back to when our country was founded. We truly are a great nation still. I believe that. I truly believe that we are a Christian nation because we were founded as one. But are we where we should be right now with the Lord? I can't imagine what, if our founding fathers were even given a glimpse of today. If, if the founding fathers had an opportunity to watch our country for one hour, I believe they would be sick to their stomachs. We have gotten so far away from the principles that are based within God's word, which is what our country was founded upon. Some of you think, man, he's going on 4th July mode. Trust me. I'm patriotic as the next guy, but just Christian first. Amen. And we were supposed to be a Christian nation, and we are getting so far away from what our country was founded upon. So let me ask the question as we start out today. Do you think we're missing the boat? Do you think we're missing the boat? Let's look at the church today. Sometimes I might be talking about this church. Sometimes I'm talking about church universal. So I want to be clear that I'm talking about church universal. But as we go through today, also think of it as an individual basis, okay? What can you contribute to your church today? So let's be keeping that in our minds as we go through. But when I think of the church universal, is the church missing the boat? Is the church missing the boat? Is the church really doing all that it can? <laughs> Not even hardly, Milford says. Milford's just being real, ladies and gentlemen. You know, people all around us in Winchester, Front Royal, Strasburg, <laughs> D.C. You can laugh, that was a joke. <laughs> Pastor Dave's funny today. West Virginia, Ohio, Canada, California, <laughs> Texas, you name it, all states. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people dying all around churches everywhere. And is the church really fulfilling the mission of which we were called to? Have we arrived as a church? Are we tapping into the power that's even available to each one of us? Are we the church that God is desiring? You guys are a quiet bunch. It's either breakfast or I've really got you wondering, boy, where is he going? I want you to look in Acts chapter 2. This is one of my favorite Sundays to preach, by the way, because um, it's Pentecost Sunday, if you guys did not know that through the church calendar. Um, but this is Pentecost Sunday. And... I love the story of Pentecost. Um, at my installation, I had my little brief message, which that was so difficult when Dr. Fuller said, I need you to preach under eight minutes. Whew. That's hard for me because that's usually my introduction. 
I mean, some of you are thinking, yeah, you're right about eight minutes right now, so time to move on. But this is one of my favorite areas because when I look at Acts chapter 2, when I look at the birth of the church, it was birthed on that day of Pentecost. This is the picture, I believe, of what God desires for his church. Now, this is the second time I've already been in this area, as I said, since I've been here with you all, and I'm going to be here a lot because this is my favorite area of Scripture because God desires this for me as an individual. God desires this for you as an individual, and he desires it for us collectively as a body. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Sorry, Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. Those who were accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, this, this is the result that came from a vision of a praying people. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common, selling their possessions and their goods, and they gave to anyone as had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. When I read that area of scripture, there are so many things that come to mind. But today, here's what I want to say about that area of scripture. That sounds fun. That sounds fun. I want to be a part of that. I literally want to jump into the pages of my Bible as I'm reading that. And I want to join the party. Woo, God's people. Get with me. Enjoying the favor. It says they were enjoying the favor of all people. They were enjoying the favor of each other. In fact, this is a group of God's people. They, didn't, they weren't fighting over carpet. They weren't fighting over colors of curtains. Oh, I, I love Dr. Jim Deal. You guys remember our general superintendent, Dr. Jim Deal? I remember the story he was sharing. I think it was in Idaho. And... Um, I watched, he was preaching a revival uh, or a camp meeting, and he was sharing the story of how he first came out of college and out of seminary, and he went to his first church, and you know, he says, I just walked in, now I'm senior pastor, and I'm going to come in, and I'm going to just clear the tables, and I'm just going to, I'm going to make the change, and I'm going to, the buck stops here, and he says, that's the mentality I had, and he says, and I walked in, and God gave me the vision, things we needed to do. I looked around, we need to paint this, we need to clean this. And he says, but then I hit the sacred cow, Sister Sally's Sunday school classroom. I wanted to paint. Those curtains needed to go. And he says, and the sacred cow was the curtains. And he says, Sister Sally came to him and he says, that really wasn't her name, but I'm using Sister Sally to protect the innocent. And then he whispered, or maybe the guilty. I don't know. But Sister Sally approached this first time senior pastor and said, Hey, Brother Jim, if those curtains go, I go. And he said, Make sure you take them with you. <laughs> but he said he quickly learned after that a little bit of grace. <laughs> People didn't fight in the early church like this. It says they were enjoying the favor. Those are words that jump out to me. They were enjoying the favor of all people. Okay, so to me, when Scripture's telling me they were enjoying the favor of all the people, there was the people that was in that prayer group, that prayer room. But also, I have a feeling I, all the people... Maybe the people that was witnessing this group of people really liked this group of people because there was something different about them. I don't know. I just like to believe that. Okay, I'm going to wear your fingers out today. We're going to go through several areas of Scripture. Um, some of you might still have pages to turn. Otherwise, I'm going to wear your eyes out. You can follow the Scriptures on the screen as well. But think about it again. Is the church missing the boat today? Now, the power that we see in Acts chapter 2, that it came out of this group of believers, this group of praying people, um, something ha this is an answer to prayer. 
This is God's power coming upon people, which we'll get into here in just a minute, but we're going to be kind of back and forth. I need you to turn clear back to the Old Testament, uh, blow the dust off of it, Old Testament, read, and we're going to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. Now, I love this area of scripture just as much as I like Acts chapter 2. This is one of my favorite prayers in the Bible. We're also going to look at another aspect of that prayer, the answer to a prayer. Woo! Don't you love when God answers your prayers? I got to tell you, it's even good when God doesn't answer your prayer. When I say it like that, I mean he just doesn't answer it in the way that you wanted him to, but his answer is always the right answer. Man, God is good, isn't he? He's cool even when he does, and even when he, everybody look this way, doesn't. I say it like that because he really does. Second Chronicles chapter 7, and we're going to look, we're going to start in um, Second Chronicles chapter 7. I can't, I can't even read my notes, 11, I should, see it's even, my screen's broken back here, so. Can I get this light right here? Can that be turned off? The other one. Can that go? It's like shining right in my side. Ah, oh, thank you. I am like seeing spots. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 7, starting in verse 11. I'm serious, I can't even see. <laughs> Can somebody read this for me? Can you come up here and read it? Or can you read it from where you're at? Okay. Uh, we're going to go through, i got to get my eyesight back. Verse 16, 11 through 16. Amen. That's good right there. I can pick the rest up. I got my eyesight back. I, can, I don't see spots anymore. But when Solomon had finished the temple, it says, the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord, the Lord and his own palace, the Lord appeared to him and he said, I have heard your prayer. He says, I have heard your prayer. And then he goes on to say, it's highlighted in green, I have chosen this place for myself. Wouldn't you love it if the God of creation just showed up and said, you know what, Winchester First Church of the Nazarene, I have chosen this place. Can I tell you something, church? God's already chosen. God has already chosen Winchester First Church of the Nazarene for something special. Oh, man. God wants us to have a party for the kingdom. I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. Verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command a locust to devour the land or send plague among my people. Verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I love this next part. Verse 13, 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and I have consecrated this temple so that my name will be there forever. Catch this next one. My eyes, my eyes and my heart will always be there. This is a promise, church. This is a promise that comes directly from God. 
A promise that says, if the church, if my people will do their part, then I'll just show up. Then I will just show up. And I will just heal their land. I will walk with them. I will talk with them. I will carry them. I will sustain them. I will encourage them. I will lift them up. If my people who are called by my name will just simply do this. God promises that he will be faithful in return. Folks, this is the God of creation saying, I will be faithful to you. Folks, that's awesome stuff. God saying, promising, I will be faithful to you if, you ever thought about the word if? I believe if, which is made up of two letters, happens to be the biggest word in the English language. Especially when we're looking at a scripture just like this. If my people are faithful, I will be faithful in return. So church, all we have to do is this, ready? Ready? We have to do the if. Right. I want God to be faithful in return from our faithfulness. And it's not just God saying, you know, if a portion of the church will just do something, then I'll be faithful. God says, if my people who are called by my name, that tells me if you are a believer... You have to do the if. Each one of us who are called by his name have to fulfill the if if we want God to be faithful. Wow. It's an answer to prayer. You go back, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Go back about, it's, for me it's one page. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 40. This is Solomon's prayer as he was dedicating the temple. Verse 40 says, Now my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers Offered in this place. Now, I wasn't here when you, when you built this facility. I'm sure there was probably a dedication service. If there was not, let's have one. Maybe a few years delayed. But nonetheless, a dedication. But here is the dedication of the temple. And he says, now my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Sound familiar? What did we just read? God showing up. And saying, I have heard your prayer. That's cool enough in itself. There's so many sermons that could come out of this. God literally responding, saying, I have heard your prayer. That tells me that the God of all creation inclines his ear to each one of us. God hears us when we call out to him. I don't know about you, but I love being a child of the king. Now, as you, you look at Second Chronicles, back to chapter, uh, chapter 7. There are some key words that we need to just remind ourselves going on in this this passage today. The words chosen, if, called, humble, pray, seek, turn, hear, forgive, heal, consecration. These are big parts of the if. We find the promise from God if we are willing as individual Christians and collectively as a body, to literally pay the price with our obedience. That's the if, our obedience. Are you missing the boat? Are you missing the boat? All right, let's go back to the New Testament. Let me give a a quick refresher from about three weeks ago. I love how the Lord in my study time is really stringing a lot of these scriptures together as we journey through these areas of the Bible together. And God's putting these in the messages. But we got to do a quick review. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Preached just about three weeks ago, I think it was. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, He said to them, 
It is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. You know what? Let's go on. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him going up into heaven. Then they returned. I like this. Here, here's the, the call to obedience. Remember, Jesus told them a few, few verses ago, go to Jerusalem. Then they returned to Jerusalem, verse 12, from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs, the room where they were staying, in the room where they were staying, those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly along with the women, or they constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. I love this picture. It's just real small, but it says they joined together constantly in prayer. They, around the clock, day after day, they joined together constantly in prayer. Verses 4 through 5, we can, we can receive blessing from God anywhere and any time. But remember, Jesus gave the call. He gave the instruction, go to Jerusalem. There they were to receive something. That something was the blessing. The Holy Spirit would be upon them, right? So if Jesus says, I need you to go to Jerusalem, folks, you don't go to Winchester. You don't go to Front Royal. You don't go to Strasbourg. If Jesus says, go to Jerusalem, talk with Randy. He can use points. Talk with Dave and Debbie. I'm sure they can hook you up some way, somehow, with some uh, miles or something. We've got enough airline people here that can get us to Jerusalem. Sorry, guys, now everybody's going to be hitting you up for miles and stuff to get to Jerusalem. Pastor Dave said you need to get us to Jerusalem, so hook us up. Verse 8, he tells them, if you go there, you're going to receive something. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not going to come through the doorway and say, hello, it's good to hang with you for a minute, and then leave. He says, you will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And to me, this says, you are going to be clothed, you're going to be enveloped, you're going to be overwhelmed, you're going to be consumed by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whew, somebody get excited, because you're going to be clothed and overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit of God. Man, you're going to be possessed, be possessed by the Holy Spirit of God, amen? amen. Whew. Verses 12 through 14. It says they went back to Jerusalem just as Jesus instructed them to do. They didn't go back simply to unwind. They didn't go back and get their PlayStations out and start playing games. They didn't go back and start watching the news. They didn't start back, they go back and watch a football game or shoot baskets or anything like that. Scripture tell, just told us that they got back to Jerusalem and they met constantly in prayer. In fact, the wording was they joined constantly in prayer. They could have gone anywhere, as I said, but the instruction was to go to Jerusalem. They joined together in prayer, constantly. What in the world were they praying about? What kind of prayers were those? This is another one of those areas. Wouldn't you just like to jump into this picture? Be a fly on the wall, if you will. And listen to the prayers that were being uttered in that room that day. I can guarantee you the prayers didn't go like this. Um, God, just be with us. Amen. God is good. God is great. We are awesome. Thank you. Amen. This is a picture of God's chosen. And when I see that they were joined constantly in prayer... This was agonizing. Maybe they were on their faces. Maybe they were sitting in their chairs rocking and weeping. Maybe they were running the room and just giving praise. I don't know what that prayer meeting looked like. But all I know is that they were being faithful before the Father. Joining 
together constantly in prayer. I have to think that after what they had been through, walking through the ministry with Jesus, you have the whole crucifixion, you have the resurrection, and then Jesus appearing to them over a period of 40 days post-resurrection, hanging out with them. I have a feeling at this point, the disciples were getting pretty excited about this coming gift of the Holy Spirit. So I have a feeling when they stepped into that room together, part of that prayer was excitement, knowing that they were about to be overwhelmed because the gift of the Spirit was about to come upon them. You guys got to remember who these guys were, these early followers, these disciples. They witnessed the miracles. They were obviously, I bet you even as they were praying in that room, they were not only praying about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but Maybe they had a brother outside. Maybe they had a sister outside. Maybe they had a parent. Just like we do today. They were praying for loved ones. That they too would somehow come in contact with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Man, there was agonizing prayer going on. I maybe believe prayer changes things. We could probably go around this room time and time again talking about the different prayers that we've witnessed or shared in our life and the answers that came along with those. We all have testimonies, I'm sure, of an answered prayer or prayers. So let's go back to Acts. Let's go into Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now remind you, prayer meeting's going on. These guys are agonizing together. They're praising together. They're praying together. They're celebrating together. I'm the only one. Oh, Tammy's smiling with me. Come on. Folks, this is good stuff. Prayer meeting going on, okay? Remember this. Acts chapter 1, prayer meeting. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. As we've been reading, they were all together. What were they doing, guys? They were all together and they were praying and they were all in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house when they were, when they were sitting. Where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Oh my goodness. The Holy Spirit, verse 4 into the room. One of these days, I got this vision of Pentecost Sunday. I would love if the if we could just somehow figure out a way for the for the Pentecost that day to put breakaway windows in the side of the church, attach things to the doorways where every single door opens at the same time as I'm reading that scripture. I'm watching Ben back there. He's got a smile on his face. Ben's already thinking we can do this. We can put this together. And I'm not done yet, okay? And somehow, some way, we can have torches drop from the ceilings above your head. You guys trust me? Do you trust Brother Ben? Because I can see he's going to engineer this. Show up next Pentecost Sunday, we are going to have a doozy of a service. And, and, and as, I'm, as I'm reading that and the, and the flames are descending upon your heads... And I'm throwing cow tongues at you? It's Pentecost Sunday. Tongues showed up too. Tongues of fire, right? I want smoke machines on each side with me. Strobe lights behind. Man, isn't that going to be awesome? You guys were just in my head for way too long, weren't you? The Holy Spirit comes into the upper room. They come, the Holy Spirit comes into that prayer meeting. Everything comes, whew, everything from here on out is done by the power of prayer. Isn't that awesome? Everything done from here on out by the prayer warriors of the literal first church of the Nazarene. That's the name of that group. Did you know that? That is the literal first church of the Nazarene. How do we know this? Scripture tells us. 
who gave the command to go to Jerusalem? The Nazarene Jesus, right? And they were following the call of the original super, general superintendent, Jesus. Dr. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem. We can claim this, Nazarenes, can't we? Amen? Some of you guys are saying, what was in his bacon? But they were following the careful instruction of Jesus the Nazarene. Something else happens, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But verse 14, Peter's there, right? I'll let you read it for yourself. You can go on. Peter stands up in the midst of this whole setting, and he addresses the crowd. Y'all remember Peter, right? He had foot in mouth disease. Not foot and mouth, but foot in his mouth disease. He was the one that always talked a good game. I will. I will. No, I won't deny you. I would never do that. Poor Peter. He gets a bum rap, doesn't he? But we also got to remember this is the same Peter that Jesus said, On you, Peter, I will build my church. On you, Peter, I will build my church. So literally what we're witnessing in our text today, this is the coming to pass of what Jesus said. Because of obedience, because of the willingness to commit, the Spirit shows up. And Peter becomes a whole new man. Peter is empowered. Peter is strengthened. Peter is encouraged. Peter is sourced by the Holy Spirit. I think of Peter. God looked down from on high, and he knew what Peter was capable of. Aren't you thankful God knows the inner workings of man? We see the different accounts where Peter kind of, whoops, whoops, oops, oops, oops. But God looked at the heart of Peter and said, just you wait. There will be a day when you will be empowered. There will be a day when you'll be sourced and you'll be a whole new man. And Peter becomes that new man. And you can take that and you can read it in the book of Acts yourself when he stands up and addresses the crowd. Just like God looked at Peter. He's looking at me today. He's looking at you today. And he wants to empower you. Let me ask you a question. What potential? What potential does he see in you today? As I'm asking that question, maybe, maybe you're saying, well, I know that God has been sticking his thumb in my back. I know that God has been prompting me to do something. I know God has been trying to push me beyond myself, and I keep resisting. Folks, when I was first called to ministry, I ran for the first six years of that because I was certain God made a mistake. I was certain. So I ran for six years. I learned in that six years. But when God calls you to something, he doesn't uncall you. Because that's the word I was given by one of my former pastors. When God calls you, he doesn't uncall you. So here's what you need to do. If you're being called to something bigger than yourself, just quit arguing. Because let me give you another fact. God has never lost an argument. God has never lost a debate. So you need to quit debating and you need to quit arguing. And you need to say, Lord, what do you need me to do? Okay, let's jump back to the beginning. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 47 through 48. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They were selling their possessions. They were selling their goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily 
those that were being saved. Wow. Folks, note what's going on there. Remember when I said at the beginning, this looks fun. Do you want, the, do you want to be a part of something like this? You want to be a part of a church that looks like this? We all should be saying, that's right, I do. I want to be a part of that. I want to be the spark that gets the fire going. I want to be the fuel on the fire. Folks, I'm telling you right now, if the church is on fire, people will come. If the church is on fire, if the church is obedient, the people will come. John Wesley said that best. He said, you catch on fire with enthusiasm and people will come from miles to watch you burn. John Wesley was a cool cat, wasn't he? We're going to close the service here in just a moment. I want to ask the praise team to come and just get themselves ready because I want to close our service with prayer at the altars because I really believe that somebody, more than some somebodies, I believe more than one here today, I know that God is calling upon your life for something. I'm not going to bring you forward and confess exactly what that is, but something you do need to do if you are wrestling right now, you do need to come forward to these altars today. And you need to take it to the Lord. And if he is calling you to do something, he's calling you to obedience, first of all. And your response needs to be, here I am, Lord. Send me.